Hi there, very good evening. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive here at the Sky News Centre. Time to see what's making the headlines with the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards. We're also joined tonight by the Daily Mail columnist Sarah Vine. Thank you both for staying up late and joining us uh, tonight. They're going to be with us from now until midnight this evening. First, though, let's see what's on some of those front pages as they come in tonight, starting with the Metro newspaper. It splashes with Prince Harry's claim that he once found what he believed to be a tracking device on his ex-girlfriend Chelsea Davies' car. The Telegraph tomorrow leads on Rishi Sunak's visit to the United States. It says that he will tell President Biden that the UK will take the lead in tackling the threat posed by artificial intelligence. The Daily Mail focuses on news that, as of today, 43 police forces across the country say they've sent officers to visit 100% of burgled homes. Our press preview colleague Pippa Carrera has a scoop in The Guardian tomorrow, reporting that Boris and Kerry Johnson broke COVID restrictions by hosting a friend at Chequers to help them plan their wedding. Onto the eye, it understands that the energy regulator Ofgem intends to make suppliers compensate customers for hidden charges that they were forced to pay. Now, the FT's UK edition is embargoed until midnight. We have the US edition for you, though. The version pictures the heavy smog currently blighting New York City. Of course, Mark Stone reporting on that a few minutes ago here on Sky News. And on to uh, the star as well for you. It uh, tells us we don't necessarily have to fear from swimming with sharks. A reminder that by scanning the QR code that you're going to see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch with us. Well, let's meet our guests again tonight. As I said, we're joined by Steve Richards and Sarah Vine. A very good evening to both of you. I know that you've been looking ahead to what's happening in the papers and we're going to start with the front of uh, the Metro tonight. And of course, their coverage, if you can imagine, it would, all, it would lead with Harry. It's exactly what they've done. Um, Sarah, take us away with this one. Harry's car tracker bombshell. Why do you think they've decided to focus on this particular uh, line of questioning that, they, that Prince Harry was uh, under in the, the High Court today? I don't know, because most of the questioning is... The, the problem with Harry is that a lot of his responses to these questions have actually been very vague. So in this case, he says... Uh, that he found a tracker on his then girlfriend's car, Chelsea Davy, um, and his sort of ex his explanation for it is, well, it happened to a friend of mine, therefore it must have been uh, a newspaper who did it that did it. But the problem is, he needs to prove these things. You can't, you know, you can't just say vaguely as he has done. You know, I I'm, I I think this was happening. I think this was a, this story was was obtained um, through a, a hacking, you know, an illegal hacking. It's got to be. You've absolutely got. Once you get to court and you get in front of a barrister, you've got to be able to prove what you're saying. And I think the problem that he's had over the last couple of days is that he hasn't really landed a killer blow um, to the mirror. Uh, the, you know, he's the, lots of speculation, lots of things that could, you know, could have been mistakes, could have been done wrong, could have been criminality, but nothing really seems to have come through as proof. And I think that this of Ch the, the the Chelsea Davy tracker thing is is a quite a good example of that because it's it's yes, it 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 would indicate that somebody was trying to follow him, but the question is who, and I don't think he really has the answer to that. Yeah, just reading a bit further into this, uh, into the, how the uh, Metro have covered it, Steve. They say that uh, that, that David Sherborne, of course, that is the KC, the, the lawyer for um, Prince Harry, uh, asked him, or well, how did you know? And he said because we found it as we as a friend had done uh, to them in London, so that they did find the tracker. But as uh, Sarah says, they just don't know who put it there. Yeah, and we could analyse the specifics for the next 24 hours. But I think what is much more interesting is the broader picture. Um, we don't have many troublemakers in politics at the moment, and we need troublemakers. I like troublemakers. And here is a troublemaker in capital letters. Uh, the royal family rarely speak in public on anything other than a few banalities. And he has decided to take on the media, which is very mighty in the United Kingdom. And I think it is courageous. He could have a much easier life not doing this, um, but he is. And there's something quite extraordinary about it. It's kind of Shakespearean on one level, this prince in exile coming back to a British court to take on 
the media. And uh, to be honest, the specific Sarah might be absolutely right that nothing is proven. But to step back from that, what uh, an incredible dynamic this is of it's a lot to do with his mother. <clears throat> but most royals, when you think about it, I know they are revered on the whole. Don't do things which are surprising and interesting. And whatever you think about him, this is surprising and interesting and I think impressive. Um, yeah, Sarah, what do you, I mean, do you, do you agree with Steve? Is this courageous of Prince Harry? It's definitely, a, it's become a life mission of his. Well, I think, I think Prince Harry's psychosis is, as, as Steve says, he's very damaged by his upbringing and what happened to his mother. Um, but a lot of that is to do with his, his uh, family and, and the way his uh, father treated his mother and what happened subsequently. Um, and Harry's focus is the media. He sees them as the villain of the piece, but it's more complex than that. The, the, the problem I think a lot of people have with Harry is that a lot of the pe people do feel sorry for him. I feel a lot of sympathy for him for all of those reasons. But he's written this awful book that he's published in which he is basically doing to his family what he accuses the press of doing to him. So, you know, in the book, he talks about how his brother isn't as good looking as he used to be and how his hair's all falling out. And then he talks about his father, you know, taking his teddy bear from his childhood. And he says, he, he, he gives away all sorts of very personal, private things about his family, which is precisely the stuff that he claims has damaged him so much. So I think what we're dealing with here is somebody who is in a lot of pain, very angry, uh, wants to lash out, wants to find a solution. But it's you know, it's just much more complex than that. And the problem with putting yourself in the courtroom like that is that when you make these accusations in a courtroom, you have to be able to prove them. You can't just say, oh, well, I found a tracker and because it happened to a mate of mine, I assumed that therefore this was happening to me. That's not good enough in a court of law. And he's put himself in that situation. And I don't think it's particularly good for him. I think whoever's advising him, whoever his friends are, need to try and stop him from doing this to himself because he is, I mean, I think, yes, it is, it is fascinating and it is interesting and all of those things, but it's not good for him apart from anything else. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, he is just okay. ripping off us cab all the time. Before, before we move on, one final word from Steve on this. And do you think ultimately he will be successful, Steve, quickly? Well, it depends what you mean by success. I mean, I think it is... Um, uh, I, I, it's all the things Sarah says it is, but it's also clearly, although I've never met the guy, but he is evidently genuinely shocked by the treatment of some media outlets towards him, towards his mother, towards other people. I know politicians who are shocked, but they're too scared to do anything because the parts of the media in this country are incredibly powerful and intimidating. Knowing all of that, he has decided to take them on. Now, as I say, it's multi-layered. But one of the motives is that, and I think the newspapers will have to, or, you know, whoever his targets are, will have to accept that part of it is them, and he is sincere about it. Now, whether he wins this or not, who knows? But I think it is quite a, a sort of impressive thing to do, given that he could just have an easy, wealthy, affluent life wherever he chooses to be. Instead, he's got a project. And okay. it is, as I say, extraordinary. OK, we're going we're gonna to talk about it in a lot more detail in the 11 o'clock hour, so we'll, we'll let park that for now. And, and let's get some more papers out the way as well. Uh, starting with the uh, front page of The Telegraph. Interesting enough, they don't really talk too much about Prince Harry. They've got a picture of the Princess of Wales instead on their front page. Read into that as you will. Uh, and they lead heavily on uh, the visit with uh, Rishi Sunak in the United States, as we've been leading here on Sky News as well. Apparently, the headline reads that he's going to tell Biden the UK can lead on AI. It's going to, uh, Britain will take the lead on tackling the threat posed by artificial intelligence, which is going to tell Joe Biden um, tomorrow. How do you think this is going to go for him, Sarah? Um, well, I, I, I don't know, because you never know with Joe Biden whether he's sort of alive or not, or listening. But the fact is that, I, I mean, Sunak is right to try and take the lead on it. He wants to have a he wants to have a, a, an organization a bit like the atomic energy organization that's basically in charge of making sure that AI doesn't get out of control or that it isn't that it isn't so unregulated that we you know, I mean one of the big issues over the last 10 15 years has been the internet and and it's and it's sort of the way it's taken over its life our lives but it's completely unregulated and I think the idea is not to make the same mistake with 
AI, which could have much more far-reaching consequences. Um, there's a lot of scaremongering at the moment about AI. You know, the debate, it, it, a lot of people think it can do a lot of good. A lot of people are terrified that it's going to, we're all going to turn into, you know, uh, 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 the Terminator. So I think the most important thing is to try and have some sort of regulation. And I think uh, for Rishi Sunak to lead the way on this is quite a good idea. I know that the cabinet are quite divided over this because half of them think that AI is great because it can make everything more efficient in government. And then the other half are a bit worried about the Terminator aspect of it. So I think it's something that needs to be discussed and it needs to be openly discussed. And it, you know, there needs to be a proper convention about it. We can't just bury our heads in the sand. And we've had Elon Musk and various other people saying the whole project needs to be paused until we've got a handle on it. So I think his, it's good that he's responding. Yeah, um, Steve, Sarah mentioned scaremongering that the Telegraph themselves says it comes just days after one of Mr. Sunak's top advisers warned that AI could kill humans, i.e. wipe out humanity within two years unless action was taken now. I mean, where do you stand on this debate? Well, well that scared the life out of me. Uh, you know, I read that briefing and it's, it, it's terrifying. But um, what happens at these meetings? And I, by the way, you know, I fully sympathise with Sunak. He'll be exhausted. It's draining as well as exciting to be, you know, in Washington, in the White House. But quite often, not much comes out of them. And this is just a briefing of number 10 saying, well, we'd like to take the lead. And Sunak will discuss this with Biden. No doubt others will try and take the lead on this. Um, there will have to be a coordinated effort at some point. But um, it, the headline implies a kind of sweeping grandeur as Sunak comes into Washington to say, we're going to take the lead. But actually, it shows that there isn't a huge amount that's going to come out of this meeting between the two of them. Um, an aspiration for Britain to take the lead, fine. Um, but, you know, a few years ago, there was a talk of a trade deal with America. Uh, it's about 25,000 miles metaphorically from that. Sarah, let's come to you for this. Um, what, what do you make of what Pippa has uh, alleged here, saying that Boris and Carrie Johnson hosted a close friend who helped plan their wedding overnight at Chequers when a number of COVID restrictions were in place? She says a lady called Dixie Maloney, a corporate events organiser, stayed at Chequers um, when there was effectively a ban on people who weren't part of households staying overnight. What do you make of this? Well, they say that she was working for them and therefore it was allowed under the rules. I think it just shows how crazy those rules and regulations were because I think if you had a reasonable But he, met the, he excuse, made the rules up, didn't he? Exactly. So uh, they claim uh, that, that she was there under, that she was fine to be there and that they checked all the rules and it was OK for her to be there. Um, I think the thing is, it's a bit of a grey area what the relationship with this girl called Dixie, why have they all got such, such strange names? Anyway, Dixie, um, uh, uh, what their relationship was, whether it was just purely work or whether there was a crossover into friends, you know, the, often in politics, uh, that happens, uh, people work together and then they become friends. So I suppose if you're in a situation where um, <clears throat> you've got some strange rules about lockdown, uh, which are a little bit indecipherable, it's easy to to shade into the grey. But yes, I mean, this is just, I mean, this is Pippa's, uh, this, is, this is an extension of Pippa's scoop when she worked at the Mirror. Um, it's more to do with, uh, it's more to do with the sort of COVID lockdown uh, party gate scandal. Um, and it will just keep running and running, I think, uh, as more and more little tidbits like this come out. OK, we're going to move on because we're tight on time tonight and we want to have a look at how the uh, Metro is covering what's been an extraordinary story for us here, blowing up of this dam in Ukraine. Uh, Steve, the Metro is saying, floody maniac, having blown up dam, Putin's next move could be to target a nuclear plant. What do you make of its coverage? Uh, well, it's deeply depressing and a sign that this is going to go on and on. I've been uh, uh, at this press preview where newspapers at times have carried reports which suggested that um, uh, Russia was in retreat, perhaps fatally. And then you get something like this, uh, which is, you know, uh, appalling on so many different levels. But it's not a sign of retreat. And, um, you know, the question is posed every now and again and needs to be, how is this going to end? How do wars end? Um, and it's not at all clear. And as you say, the suggestion, as well as reporting the consequences of the uh, flooding of the dam, in effect, um, the speculation of targeting nuclear plants. I mean, it's it looks as if things are going to 
intensify um, and um, it's not at all clear how this is all going to end. And a quick look at uh, the FT before we do this in a bit more detail on the top of the hour. Uh, the FT, we've got the US edition rather than the UK edition, but a, a fantastic picture of, uh, of New York City and the skyline. People we think are probably doing some yoga of some sort. And of course, the smog, high alert, smog stifles New York. We've had some extraordinary pictures ourselves from Mark Stone. I mean, talk about pollution. You wouldn't want to be there at the moment, Sarah, would you? No, this is the smoke from the wildfires, isn't it? Uh, further north in Canada. No, it looks awful. It reminds you of those pictures you used to see of London in the 1950s um, when it was known as the big smoke. Yeah, I mean, I'm un uh, very unpleasant. Um, apparently, it's affecting Washington as well. So I hope Rishi Sunak's got his mask. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, Steve, a, a quick word. I mean, it, it would be terrible to be there right now. And you can just imagine the health effects, can't you? I mean, so it's only one shot that we had. The sky was orange. Never seen anything quite like it. Yeah, I mean, amazing television pictures, aren't they? Because, you know, you can convey right away how weird it is. Yeah, one breath, and you think that's the equivalent of knocking about 20 gulwats or something. You know, it is... OK. Uh, yeah. We'll leave it there. Steve Richards and Sarah Vine, thank you so much for that.